Thank you, Sherry. I just, uh, I think that that's so fitting today as we are in uh, the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, be turning there. Uh, it's, it's good to know that we are never alone. And uh, just praise the Lord. I like, uh, I like the praise service at Heartland. And it's good to fellowship and get to shake some hands this morning and see some people and, and embrace folks. And it's just good to, it's good to be here. You glad you're here this morning? Amen. I am too. And, uh, you know, as Paul sat in his jail cell, I'm sure he felt alone at times. Uh, and yet, uh, that song that Sherry sang just reminds me of the reality that we are never alone because God is in us of a truth. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. If you're saved this morning, and it could be that uh, you come this morning and, and, you, and you truly feel all alone. You feel separated. You feel abandoned. You feel very far from uh, others and God. And I pray this morning that God will use this time to encourage you in the Word. And if you do have a Bible, I already encourage you to turn to 2 Timothy. If you don't, there should be a Bible in, in the seat in front of you. Here at HBF, we uh, teach and preach from the Bible. This is God's Word. We believe that God literally speaks to us through the Bible and that we can freely speak to Him when we pray. We can just talk to God because Jesus Christ is our mediator and He intercedes for us. So uh, we are really dependent on the Word. So if you don't have a Bible, just uh, look in front of you in the seat and there should be in Iraq a Bible that you can find and turn to page 918 uh, this morning. We'll be looking in this, this text as we trust God will be speaking to us. Uh, now I'm going to switch some gears for you this morning. We're going to be focusing on a soldier. Uh, I want to just ask you, how many of you have ever heard of the term operational readiness? Aha, you gave yourself away. Uh, and so operational readiness, OR, I guess as you call it, or uh, uh, have, you may have heard this before, combat readiness. How many of you have heard of combat readiness? Okay, some of you, not as many as I had actually thought. So um, this morning I want to just talk to you a little bit about operational readiness or combat readiness. Um, I'll tell you what, Mr. T.S., since you're our guest, but you're one of us, tell me, what is operational readiness? Being prepared for, Being prepared for anything that's coming your way. That's right. The official definition is the capability of a unit formation or unit uh, or formation, ship, weapon system, equipment to perform the mission or functions for which it is organized or designed. It may be used in a general sense to express a level or degree of readiness, as, uh, as our brother Sean just told us. So it's being ready, right? Having, as they like to say, locked and loaded, right? You're ready to go. Anything comes up, you're ready. Now, how many of you know what combat readiness is? All right, all of you do now, all right? You know what it is. You just learned something, so that was worth the price of admission. All right, so the scripture describes that we are to be ready. We're always to be ready. We're to be ready for the Lord's coming. We're to be ready to give a witness. We're to be instant in season, out of season. First Peter chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 13, and uh, you don't have to turn there, it says, and who is he that will harm you, right? When you think of readiness, you're usually in a defensive posture. Uh, perhaps you're getting ready to go into an offensive position, but it's usually for what? The defense. You think about in a military sense, why do we have missions and we have operations, even when they're offensive, it is for the defense or the uh, procurement protection of the assets of our nation, right? To procure the homeland, the security of the homeland. So he says, and who is he that will harm you? Are you fear, fearful? Man, in our culture today, man, fear is raging. Everybody's on edge. Everybody's worried about a terrorist. Everybody's worried about this or that. Who's going to harm you, really? Good question. If you be followers of that which is good. But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Doesn't that sound a lot like what Paul's already said to Timothy? God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He's like, hey man, if you have a clear conscience, if you're walking with God, what do you have to be worried about? Don't be scared. Don't be scared of, you know, Johnny Jihadist or whatever. Don't worry about it. He says in verse 15, but this is what you do need to do. This is what Brian Hedges needs to do. This is what Hartland needs to do. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I like that, meekness and fear. Because when you think about the circumstances in which Peter is speaking, it's obviously a situation of persecution. Why do you need to be meek if you're being persecuted? I mean, you're the one that is supposedly 
on the defensive. It's because of the reality is this. We have all the resources of heaven. We fear not our own demise, but the demise of those that might even persecute us. Why? Because we already won. We're already victors. That's what the Bible teaches. You take my physical life, but I'm going to come back at the end of the tribulation with a big can of Jesus that will open up, right? And so I'm worried for you if you're not on Jesus' side. That's how I got saved, beloved. I read the end of the story and realized I'm on the wrong side of the story. I better, I better repent. I better get saved. And that's what happened. I got saved. It goes on to say here, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evil, evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that they suffer for well, if, that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing. There's an implication here that you're going to suffer either way. There are times and there are places where you're just going to suffer. So Peter just says, get used to that, love on that concept, and just make sure when you suffer, you're doing it for good. Hoorah, amen? Now that doesn't sound, you're like, Brian, come on. I am not alone. I need some comfort this morning. Well, I pray that the Lord will provide it. Peter is informing the saints that they need to be ready, always with an answer. Are you always ready with an answer of the hope that lies within you? That is a reflection of if we are sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. Now, positionally, we're sanctified. But pr practically speaking, day to day, are we setting ourselves apart? Are we setting the Lord apart in our heart? Is he the one that our heart desire is focused on? Now, t Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we haven't gotten there yet, but I'm going to give you a little peek. 2, Peter, or 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, chapter 4, he says in verse 2, preach the word, and then he says, be instant, be ready. This is our weapon, right? The Bible, it's our sword. He says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He is talking about operational readiness. He is talking about being prepared in a spiritual sense to be ready to go, locked and loaded, as they might say. You should be ready. I should be ready. Even when you don't feel like being ready. Anybody ever been there? Oh, man. If I could give you a dime for every time God has called me into action when I don't feel ready. That doesn't mean you're, shouldn't, you should still be ready even when you don't feel ready. You should be full of the Word of God, filled with the Spirit, regardless of how you feel physically. It's, it's irrelevant. And that's really the point of the text that we're going to look at this morning as we turn our attention to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Why would a soldier, a unit, or a formation need to be ready? Well, because there's a threat. And if there wasn't a threat, you wouldn't need to be ready. It's not just uh, to do this for fun, not just fun and games. It's because there's actually really a roaring lion seeking to devour you. Because there are someone that acts like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. They're really just a serpent. But the reality is this. You are a target. Not just because you live in America, not just because all that. You're a target because Christ dwells in you. You have the ability to reproduce eternal life in the, in the lives of other people through the power of the gospel, through the word of God. You have a target on your back, and that is why you need to be ready, and that's why we exist as a church. My primary function from Ephesians chapter 4 is to equip you, to ready you, to make you ready to go, locked and loaded at all times. I like this kind of sermon because it actually gets to the core and the essence of who we are and what we're doing here. And so if you look at the text this morning, we're going to just pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 2 once again. And let's just stand in, in honor of God's word. I know you've stood and sat, and let's stand again this morning. Sorry if your notes fall off your lap. But let's just honor God's word and, and look at this text together. Uh, it's fitting if we're going to talk about being soldiers this morning, we should stand in honor of the word of God. The Bible says in chapter 2 and verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much this morning for the privilege of your word, and I pray, God, that we would be a good soldier and that we would please you because ultimately we have not chosen you. You've chosen us. 
2,000 years ago, you died on the cross. You gave your, your life so that all who would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. We thank you so much for loving us first. Oh, Heavenly Father, we're thanking you for the reality that we are now called the sons of God, 1 John chapter 3, that we are stewards, and it's required in a steward that we be found faithful. And now you're growing us in our identity as we are now seeing ourselves as it is in truth, soldiers, soldiers of the cross. Lord, we pray, God, that we wouldn't be a bad soldier, but a good soldier, that we wouldn't please ourselves, but we would please you. We thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, if you're here, I, I don't know where we are, right? Everyone's in different places. Uh, some of you are wounded. Some of you are ready. Some of you are just flat clueless. And, um, and so we're all in these different places. And I don't mean that as an insult. You, maybe, you, you know, maybe you're just born again. You don't even understand all these terms. You're like trying to learn the language. I use these terms and these words. You're like, what are you saying? Communicate to me, Brian. I tell you this, regardless of where we are at, it's important that we get ready. It's important that we understand who we are. And as we begin th- we've been going through this, this sermon series, we've seen already that we are a son. Everything rests on that, right? First John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. That is unique in every dispensation, that we individually are called the sons of God. This is the only time where individuals actually have the, 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 that, that relationship with God. The whole nation of Israel in the Old Testament was looked at as a son And God dealt with them corporately. We, although he deals with us corporately through the church, has a very unique and special and intimate relationship with us through the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. It's amazing what happens when we get saved. And because of that incredible blessing, we are stewards. Right? That's what chapter 2 and verse 2 is about, being the steward of the mysteries of Christ. We are stewards of God's word. It is required of a steward that they be found faithful, 1 Corinthians says. And so we need to understand that God loves us. We're a beloved son. God is trusting us. We're stewards of the mysteries of God. We're stewards of the word of God. We're stewards of the things that God has given us. But also now, notice what he says in verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness. He starts off the chapter with thou therefore. And uh, we're going to continue to work through all these different aspects. And and, uh, we can go past that slide now. We'll look at those in weeks to come. But this morning... Uh, you will remember that we are a son. Faithful men need examples, they need examples, and they need to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Strong in the grace. That's what he says in verse 1. And then he talks about the, the, the stewardship. It's important to collect God's word, commit God's word. And then as we ended the sermon last week, this is what I told you. I said, commit to reproduce. Well, no, not last week, two weeks ago. So some of you may have slept since then. Commit to reproducing faithful men who re- reproduce faithful men. And I said, pray strategically and passionately. That's what a faithful steward does. Collect God's word faithfully. Listen to what God is saying and hear God's calling. And then I said this, deploy regularly. That means go out and do the work of ministry. Take what God has given you and get it out. And then deposit frequently. Take what God has given you, not just tossing it out, but find strategic places to put the word of God in the hearts of other faithful Uh, men and women. And then you will see fruit if you continue fearlessly and faithfully, which is really the essence of what I'm talking about in chapter 2, following up on what we saw in chapter 1. And so the discipline of a faithful soldier is paramount as we go forward in our relationship with Jesus Christ. What I described in my review is the need to be ready for combat. If you are in the army, you don't just give a bunch of young men weapons and point them toward a target and say, go get them, boys. When that does happen, um, if they come up against an army that's uh, better prepared, better trained, even with less weapons, they will be destroyed. Why? Because it's important that they prepare for combat. You train them. And that's what a faithful steward does. They train faithful men who are able to teach others also. Now, when Paul opens up and he says, thou therefore, you know, he's saying something. Now, we haven't looked at this in a few weeks, so let me help you here. Now, if you go back and and you identify as a faithful steward in verse 2, you'll notice that in verse 1, there's those exact same words as as he says, Thou, therefore, my son. 
And when we see the word therefore, we're supposed to find out what it's there for, right? So we know in chapter three, 2 and verse 3, thou therefore, why? Well, because you're a faithful steward. Well, we're a faithful steward that's a son, and then Paul takes us to verse 1, thou therefore. Therefore what? Well, that takes us back to chapter 1. Remember, Paul told Timothy, don't be afraid, Timothy. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but power and of love and a sound mind. Then in verse 8 of chapter 1, he tells him, he says, hey, Timothy, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. All right, I've covered that before. But notice what it says after the, the semicolon there. He says, but be thou partaker of the, here it comes, afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Timothy, you need to be ready to suffer because there's some affliction that goes with this command. And you don't need to be fearful. And of course, I've talked about the examples. I'm not going to re- go back over all of that. But the reality is that is what the therefore is there for. Because Paul is letting Timothy know that the things that that he's going to endure are going to be difficult. And he needs to be a good soldier. He needs to be a a good son, a good faithful steward. And he needs to be a disciplined soldier. Now, have you ever considered how your identity impacts your discipline? I, I don't know about you. Has anybody thought about that? I'm actually just seriously asking you a question. I was preparing this message and I was thinking about that how your identity actually impacts your discipline, right? If you said, Brian, you have to wrestle somebody in six months from now. I'd need six months, let me tell you. If you said, Brian, you need to wrestle someone in six days from now, I got news for you. Right now, I'm not identifying as a wrestler. I'm a fat old preacher. But if you said, Brian, you, in six months, you're going to have a wrestling match. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to endeavor because... I'm going to believe that I'm actually going to be on the mat. I'm going to endeavor to get myself in some sort of shape because I know I can't go six minutes in the condition I'm in right now. I'd be lucky to go six seconds, right? And so I would do what I could to train. Why? Because if I really believe that's who I am, I'm going to do the things necessary to prepare myself. You think a law enforcement officer just walks through life thinking he's never going to have a confrontation with a bad guy? Because he puts on the uniform, because he is an officer, he walks around, uh, and you know what? He is, he is a guy that is expected to confront the bad guys. And so what he has to be ready for that. Same thing for a soldier. Same thing for anything you do. Whatever you're, you do in any vocation, any area of life, if that's what you're identifying with, you've got to be ready. When you get up and go to work in the morning, you might be a janitor. Well, you need to be ready to be a janitor, whatever that entails. Your identity affects your discipline. You prepare yourself for the tax, tasks that are ahead of you. And the Apostle Paul is calling, the, calling Timothy out and saying, hey, Timothy, uh, you are a son of God, and because you identify with Christ, it's important that you are a faithful steward, and additionally, you need to be a ready soldier, son, because you are going to get into a scrap. It's going to happen. You need to ready yourself. You need to be ready to engage because you know what's coming. It's not enough to dress up like a soldier. It's imperative that the men who complete boot camp actually are soldiers. So what do they do? They change their identity. They ring them in there, shave their head, give them a number, put them in a unit, and then they start what? Discipline them. Discipline them. Why? So that they can prepare themselves for combat. They must be willing to stay in rank, obey orders, do their duty, put the goal of others ahead of themselves, and it's no wonder Paul speaks to Timothy in these terms because they're in a, they're in a battle. Can you throw me that, Sam? I'm getting a little cotton mouth. Good. Usually underhand's better, but... Whatever it takes. Okay. Mitch Newland gave me this book called Jesus is an Airborne Ranger by uh, John McDougall. Um, and he's actually an airborne ranger. And he makes the case that the Jesus of Scripture isn't the Jesus being presented at church on most Sundays. He, he presents the idea that Jesus oftentimes, I'm not saying this church, but oftentimes in many churches is, is promoted as a wimpy Jesus. And I thought about that. I'll give you my comments in a minute. Let me give you this quote. He says, Over the years, as I've listened to rangers share their experience with Christianity, I've noticed a problem. 
It shows up again and again, mind you. These warriors are among the toughest of the tough. They're, they're the type of men who walk into the Army Career Center, slam their fist on the desk, glare at the recruiter, and growl. Give me the hardest thing you've got. But here's the tension. It's hard for tough guys to follow Jesus. And he says this, and I agree wholeheartedly. The problem isn't Jesus. Amen? It's not Jesus. Uh, he goes on to say the problem is the Jesus who is presented to them. Ask yourself, how do most churches today portray Jesus? He is the tender shepherd, the meek and mild, which he is that. He's the long-haired boyfriend and the one we're all supposed to sing love songs to. He's the bearded therapist who wishes we'd all become nice guys. We all know we're nice guys, Finish. How could our nation's fighting men possibly re relate to such a pale-faced, slack-jawed, pretty boy? Hey, that's his words, not mine. So perhaps you felt the same way. It's not just soldiers who are put off by the image of a wimpy Jesus. Lots of men and women have the same reaction. We've been handed a skewed, sanitized, weakened understanding of Jesus. Not only is this bad theology, but it also gives us a bad role model. Real men can't relate to this feminized Christ, and they shouldn't have to. The Sunday school Jesus gives us no understanding of why we're here on earth and what we're up against, and what we're supposed to do. We need something more. Well, hang on to that thought. We need something more. I think John's on to something here. Now, during the Philadelphian church age, which is, you know, back in the 1800s, 1700s, the church identified with the militant aspects of Christ. Among the other aspects, of course, there's lots of ways, but we're focusing on chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 this morning. And they would sing songs like this, Onward, Christian Soldier. How many of you heard that song? Just kind of curious. So a lot of you have heard Onward, Christian Soldier. Some of you younger folks may have never heard this song. Onward, Christian Soldier. You sing this all the time in the church, just 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Sing it all the time. Onward, Christian Soldiers, marching as the war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward in the battle, see the banners go. At the sign of triumph, Satan's host doth flee. On the Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundations quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices. Loud your anthems raise. Like mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided. All one body we. One in hope and doctrine. One in charity. Well, that's rich. Crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, and that cannot fail. Onward then, you people, join our happy throng. Blend with your voices in triumph song. Glory, lot, and honor under Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels sing. And of course, the refrain is onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Man, th those, are, those are strong, strong words. That is not a wimpy Jesus at all. That's a call to soldiers. It's a call to a church to rally. There's another, one of my favorite songs is Sound the Battle Cry. Sound the Battle Cry. See the foe is nigh. Raise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on. Stand firm, everyone. Rest your cause upon his holy word. Strong to meet the foe, marching on we go, while our cause we know must prevail. Shield the banner high, gleaming in the light, battling for the right will never fail. O thou God of all, hear us when we call, help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, may we wear the crown before thy face. And of course the refrain is, rise then soldiers, rally around the banner, Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout a Lord, Lord Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throng. How many of you heard that one before? Less. Oh, man, I love that one. That's probably my most favorite. You're like, Brian, you're like this dude of antiquity. No, I'm making a point here. That was written in 1869. Why aren't we singing like that today? Oh, well, we gotta go sing hymns. I'm not even talking about hymns. I'm talking about just singing, singing like that today. Are we creating songs like that? Or is that our heart today? Are we sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts? Are we ready? Are we soldiers? Are we marching forward into the battle? 
Those were great songs that reflected the mindset of the saints. Ministries like the Salvation Army were formed and the understanding that the church needed to mobilize, reach the world as an awakening that moved men to endure hardness. Now there are stories in our history books. Men like William Carey, Adoniram Judson, David Livingston, George Mueller, Amy Carmichael, and many others, they mobilized to accomplish God's mission in God's power. And the saints from that era understood what it was to endure hardness because they understood they were in a spiritual battle. Their identification with Christ prepared them to endure very difficult circumstances. Now, the New Testament identifies the church and the saints in a military term. So this isn't just a bunch of history. This is the biblical reality. Paul identified individual Christians. Every one of us, if you say you're saved this morning, can apply this passage to yourself. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25 says, Yet I suppose it's necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and he says, fellow soldier. When Paul looked around, he wasn't looking, he was looking for soldiers. He wasn't looking for therapists, right? He was looking for soldiers, He wasn't looking for, I like that, boyfriend Jesus. He wasn't looking for boyfriend Jesus. He was looking for soldiers. He says, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. He he says, Epaphroditus, he's a fellow soldier. He didn't just say that about Epaphroditus. In Philemon 1, 2, he says, and our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our our fellow soldier and the church in thy house. So Paul did this on numerous occasions. Paul mentions to the Corinthians that a man of God uh, supplies himself as a good soldier. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, he says, Who goeth a warfare any time in his own charge? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? And then he says, and it's in the context of, Muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn. What is Paul's point? Paul's basically teaching that a man of God must be ready. He must be ready to go like a military soldier. You don't go to war without supplies. The supply line is mission critical. Patton knew that in World War II. That's why he told Omar Bradley, I'm sorry, uh, we're stealing your supplies so we can advance the front. Why? Because supplies are that important. You procure what you need to be ready to fight the battle. That's what the Apostle Paul is speaking of. He's going to talk about that further in a couple points ahead in this same chapter, chapter 2. He goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 6, many of you are familiar with this, so I won't get into too much detail. Ephesians chapter 6, right, the whole armor of God. He tells the Christian, you know what, you need to gird up yourself. You need to be ready with the armor of God. The entire body is covered. The loins are girded about with truth. The breastplate of righteousness, the feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There's a shield of the spirit which quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. There is the helmet of salvation, and there is the only offensive weapon you have, and that is the sword of the spirit, and you are to be locked and loaded, ready to go. But many of us don't sanctify the Lord God in our heart. We don't get up in the morning. We don't prepare our heart, and we don't take God's word seriously. And so when the battle's on, people are getting shot. Man, I'm glad there were cops available in California, 300 plus uh, that responded to those two whack jobs last week, right? It could have been terrible. Pipe bombs going off everywhere and everything. Why didn't that happen? Because there were men that were ready. There were men that were ready. I don't want to get militant on this thing in that sense, although it's a good analogy. The last thing that's mentioned in Ephesians 6, by the way, is you better have your radio on. Well, it doesn't say radio. It says this. You better be praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit for all saints. Why? Because it's so imperative the communication lines are open. The battle's on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, but let us who are of the day You say you're saved. You say you're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennium. That's our rest. Actually, our rest is Christ. It's the rest for Israel, but that's a whole other story. So you think Jesus is your rest? You're going to rule and reign with him in in that day, in in the coming millennium? You're going to return at the second coming of Christ and start that day off? If that's who you are, if that's who your identity is, listen, this is what Paul says. He says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. He says, listen, if you think you're gonna return at the second coming of Christ as what? A soldier. That's what's happening in Revelation chapter 19 at the second coming of Christ. After the rapture, after the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, we come back as a military unit. He says, if you think you're part of that, as the Bible promises, then start putting your armor on now. 
Today is the day to be prepared. Today is the day to take this book seriously, to engage in the battle, beloved, because if you aren't doing it today, you're not gonna be of much use at the second coming. You're gonna be naked and ashamed. I'm not even sure God's gonna pony you up a horse. You may be in the stalls shoveling some dung, man. I don't know if there's heavenly dung, but if there is, that's probably what I'll be doing. I'll be glad to be there, though. A good soldier fights a good fight. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, the apostle Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Not just any old fight, the good fight. Don't just be a soldier, be a good soldier. Lay hold on eternal life. Wherein too thou art also called. You're called, I'm called to this. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. You know, there is a great cloud of witnesses and they're looking down right now on what we're engaging in. You say, well, Brian, they don't have their bodies yet. I know, they, they have a heavenly body that's a terrestrial one. They'll get their, or I mean a celestial one. They'll get their terrestrial one at the rapture and then we'll come back in those terrestrial units to execute the judgment. All right, that's what that's all about. So, so listen, they are, there's a great cloud of witnesses and they're looking in on what we're doing. And I know that we're all willing to endure hardness. I know that, this church really is. When there's a call to minister to unreached people groups, you all mobilize, like in three weeks. Bam, there's a team, and you're on it. You're in the, literally the uttermost parts of the earth, enduring hardness in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense. And that's awesome. And that's what I'm talking about. Now, if we can do that in Asia, can we do that at home? If we can do that in Asia... Can we do that at work, at school? You say, well, that's someone else. No, that's us. We all have to be ready. If you say you're saved, I just showed you the verses. You're called to be ready. You're called to engage. John McDougall alluded to the fact that men need something more, and women as well. And I submit to you that we have something more. And we're looking at it in the text this morning. God has called you to be saved and join this unit. If you, literally, if you're born again and you're saved and you're in, now it doesn't mean everybody here has to be a member of this church, but if you're part of the body of Christ, if you're biblically saved, you're scripturally born again, you need to be in a local church. And that local church needs to know what it is doing on this earth. It needs to be squared away and understand that every member needs to be locked and loaded because we are in a real battle for real souls. This was so heavy on my heart that several years ago, I put together this list of seven realities of HBF. And I haven't rolled it out uh, lately, but the first reality is that, you know what, we are a church of real people. All walks of life are welcome because everyone needs to be saved. And real Christians need to be obedient. If we aren't, we won't resemble Christ. And because if we, if we are, we'll form real relationships. And people who are Christians who minister to their, uh, to, in a real way will have impact on their marriages, their family, their friendships, all the relationships will prosper. And inevitably, God will lead us to real battles. Christians who are actively engaged in ministry Listen to me, that matters. That's not the first step, is it? That's like the fourth one down the line. You probably can't even see it, but you can see that. It's the fourth one down, why? Because it takes time to get there. Paul didn't just pop out and say, hey, Timothy, be a soldier. He says, first you need to be a son. Then you need to be a faithful steward. But I'm telling you, this is where it's leading you. It's leading you to being a soldier because if you're doing what God wants you to do, he was gonna use you in real battles, Real battles that matter. What do I mean by real battles? I don't mean like getting in a fist fight. I mean getting involved in things that puts the devil on notice that you mean business. You roll into town and you say, hey, I'm serious about seeing someone saved. I'm serious. I'm gonna pray about this. I'm gonna pray that someone, that God would give me an opportunity to minister the gospel. I'm gonna believe God's word that when, when the door opens, I'm gonna speak the word of God and I'm gonna see God transform someone from the inside out as they trust him by faith. They get saved. I had someone in our church this week came up to me in the foyer and said, Brian, and this person's been saved a while, he said, this week I led the first person I've ever led to Christ. She was fired up. Why? Because God used her in a real battle. It was a friendship. It was, it was just steps. I'm just, it was a real person, a real relationship, a real open door, a real opportunity. And you know what? She was ready with the gospel. And guess what? Someone was delivered. It's incredible. You know what she became? A real minister of the gospel. That's what God wants us all to be doing. And when you do enough of that, you become a real leader. And some of you, God will want to rise up and send you to other war zones. Because there's all kinds of places we need to be going to fulfill the mission of God. 
I'm glad I could finally actually roll this chart out in a, in a real sermon. <laughs> so, so we follow up that process. Let me break this down so you can get your head around it because you're like, okay, that's a lot of stuff that's really real, Brian. I don't know where to start. Well, let me just start with this. What's that really look like here at HBF? We need to make disciples. That's what verse two is all about. We need to edify. We need to learn. You need to learn the word of God. But the, 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 the disciples followed Jesus. Where do you live, Jesus? I just want to know about this guy John the Baptist is talking about. They followed him. They learned of him. But as we go and we follow him, we end up ministering together. We get involved in ministry. Here at HBF, we call it exercise. There's edify. That's where you're built up. And then you exercise. Like a sponge. You get all filled up. Then you need to be wrung out. Take all, there's lots of knowledge you can learn. But you don't want to get puffed up, 1 Corinthians 8. So you need to get wrung out. You need to exercise that which you learn. And then, uh, for, and then we multiply mightily. We engage. As you grow in the Lord, as you understand who you are in Christ, as your identi- identity affects your discipline, what happens is you don't have to be somebody else. You don't have to be doing something else. You become content in who God saved you to be. Why? Because you know who you are in Christ. You understand your identity. And you're content to serve God right there. I mean, that doesn't mean you don't go or you stay. That's not the point any longer. The point is you've matured to the place that you are now about engaging in real battles. You're about doing that which God has saved you to do. And that's what it's all about. That's when Jesus says, follow me. And you say, sir, yes, sir. Where would you like me to go? What about John? Jesus says, don't worry about John. Just follow me. Just follow me. So if we plan for real battles, we understand that that implies we need to be soldiers. So how are we doing as a church? How are we doing individually? Right now, we have real battles. Anyone name one? I'll tell you right now, this morning, across that hallway, it's a real battle. The west wing of our church, where all the kiddies are. A lot of times in the church, oh, that's over, that's just the kids. No, that is the disciples. That's generation now. They'll be here for, you know, I looked out and saw Savannah today. I'm like, I remember, she says, baby, it's crazy, time flies. We got real battles right here. Are we engaging in them? The reality is that we're either not ready, not willing, or not aware of real battles. Because there's places right here in the church that need help. You know what that also reflects? There's places in the church that need help. And I don't mean positions and ministry. There's probably, if I could go seat to seat to seat, there's needs in the lives of the body of Christ. The big battle is affected because we've got to win the small battles. And there's a battle in every home, every family, all the relationships. I know because the devil hates you. He wants to destroy you. And that's why you have to be ready that's so why you got to take this stuff seriously and not just, you know, jack around with going to church and playing games at the foot of the cross. I mean, good night. If, if that's the church you want, I can't pastor it. I can't live that way myself. It just, it just, it just, that is not who God saved us to be, and that is not what he's called us to do. If we go down that route, what will happen is people will be lost for all of eternity. And some of those people will be some of the people in the West Wing in the E-Wing. And God forbid, that's our heritage. And that's, man, man, that would be terrible. So we got real battles, <clears throat> and they're easy to find. <clears throat> and so, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like, oh, man, I got to go, you know, drop blood. It doesn't matter if it's a detention home, prisoners of hope, life issues, hermeneutics, volleyball, children's ministry. I mean, a lot of, you know what I found? Ministry is actually enjoyable. You notice how military people, the men always... Because of the stress of the engagements, they often form these relationships that last their whole life. You know, ministry is a lot like that, too. When you get involved in ministry and a ministry group, you're in some sort of group that's doing ministry in the church, you're going to form relationships that are incredible. And those relationships, they're going to, they're going to last, and they're going to be helpful, and they're going to encourage you. You guys see that on display. You, you know that. When you look around at HBF, most of the missionaries that we know, most of the relationships that we have with other churches and pastors, what are those? Those are just dudes and dudettes that we were hanging out doing real ministry with once. And it's over time, God has sent us out to do some other real battles in other war zones. And so we stay connected. Why? Because ministry does that to you. 
It connects you. And you know that's true if you're involved in ministry. It makes you tight with the people you serve with. That's a good thing. And so let me get this message done because I'm running out of time. So let's talk about this. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy thou therefore endure hardness as a, good, uh, as a good soldier. The implication from the text is that a good soldier endures hardness and a poor soldier does what? What do you think a poor soldier does? What's, if, if, if a good soldier endures hardness, you guys are scared to talk to me. Am I intimidating or something? So what's a, what's a, what's a, what's a poor soldier do? What's that? Runs. Runs. Yep. Quits. Right. If a good soldier endures, sticks it out, stays with it, a bad soldier, what are they going to do? They're going to quit. They're just going to quit in some fashion. They may run. They may hide, you know. Remember Saul in the Old Testament? Battle. Where's he at? King Saul. Where's he at? He's hiding. He runs. Why? Because he didn't have a heart. God was looking for a man with a heart. A good soldier is going to endure. A bad one's going to wimp out, as we like to say. There are no wimpy Christians laying their lives down in the ten pagan Roman persecutions. The Apostle Paul was preparing Timothy. Timothy and the church is going to have to be ready for that. They're going to have to be ready for the Dark Ages. They're going to have to be ready for the Reformation. All of that persecution, all of those things that went on. To deliver, listen to us, beloved. Listen to the word of God. Because God delivered us the word here today. There have been people that have paid a price to give us this English book, to give us this Bible, to give us the opportunity to reach the world, to deliver us to an awesome country, even still today, where we can get the word of God to the world. Whether they're coming in as refugees or we're flying overseas or whatever we're doing, we just need to get it done. Why? Because we don't quit. American Pastor Saeed this morning is in Iran in a jail cell, enduring hardness as a good soldier. There are no wimpy Christians succeeding in the mission field today. You can go talk to Harold and Tammy or Randy and Julie or Brian Clark or Mindy Clark or Doug Pearson and Bethany or Doug and Camilla Howie, and I could just keep going and going. I'm telling you guys, those are not wimps. It's difficult to serve the Lord at times. <clears throat> the man who spoke here last Sunday night, I don't know if you picked up on it, but it's difficult to serve the Lord in the circumstances that they're in. It's hard but they endure hardness. Why? Because they know they've already won. They know that God's word is, is, is worth it. And they understand that, you know what? That God has already supplied the need. And they're just serious about loving God. When you're having a bad day because therapist Jesus isn't coddling you, this is what you've got to remember. That you, have a, you haven't had a day as bad as Paul. So let God be your therapist. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is a bad day. As, as Paul is being questioned, questioned as far as his, uh, his uh, ability to minister, he won't glory in his, he doesn't want to glory uh, too much. So he says in the chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, verse 22, Are you Hebrews? So am I. Are, you, are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I spent in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I'm not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I'll glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. And this is what I really like, verse 31. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, knoweth I lie not. That list seems extravagant. And you know what? He's like, that's every bit of it's true. When Paul writes to Timothy, now Timothy knows this. He's traveled with Timothy. Uh, he knows when Paul says, hey, Timothy, I need you to endure hardness as a good soldier. He knows exactly what Paul's talking about. Why? Because he's already been enduring hardness as a good soldier. Timothy is not a wimp. Timothy, even though he may have a weak stomach, 
He's not some wimp. This guy has been faithful. He is, he is so faithful that, that Paul is leaning on him as his right-hand man. He's like, this is my replacement. This is my son in the Lord. Timothy, nonetheless, continued to be strong. And it's a sad thing when a man like Paul had to prove his value as a minister. When he had to do it, he didn't appeal to his intellect. He didn't appeal to his heritage as a Hebrew and all of that, though he could have done all those things. No, he appealed to his sufferings, listen to me, as a good soldier. As a good soldier. If you identify with God as a son, 2 Timothy 2.1, and as steward, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, it's imperative that you see yourself as a soldier. That means you follow orders. You obey God immediately, exactly, and with the right heart attitude. Ephesians 6 starts off with that, right? He doesn't, before you even get to being a, a, a soldier, what do you got to start off as? as a child? Obey. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. If you're a soldier and you won't obey, you're no good to your unit, you're no good to yourself, and you're no good to the people you're defending. James chapter 4 and verse 17, Therefore, uh, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you know what to do and you don't do it, that's sin in itself. And by the way, I think we're all guilty of that, so let's repent today. That means we don't answer again, right? Titus 2, 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering again. When God calls us to do it, just do it. When there's a need, we fill it. That means we behave with honor. Philippians 1, 27, only let not your conversation be as becometh the gospel, or I'm sorry, only let your conversation be as it becometh, or make it the gospel of Christ look good, that whether I come and see you or, absent, or be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And that means we endure affliction patiently. In this same chapter, in verse 10, Paul says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory, including, in Paul's case, death. And so we're willing to suffer the death of self. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he said, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. In 2 Corinthians 4, 12, he said, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that uh, he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you for all things or for your sakes, that the abundance of grace might be through thanksgiving, uh, uh, may redound into the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While well, we look not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, Paul said, hey, if you're a Christian, you need to endure hardness. You're not looking at the, the, the current situation. You're looking at what's to come. And one of the things that's so important that we do is avoid entanglements. In verse 4, he says that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Isn't it interesting when somebody is immoral, they are in a what? An affair. What does that affair do? They get tangled up in it, and it ruins their life, ruins other people, ruins their family. That's what an affair does. He says there's affairs you can't afford to get tangled up in if you're going to be a soldier. Hebrews 12.1, wherefore, seeing also, we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. There are some things that weigh us down. And the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We may be having things in our rucksack that are just too heavy. And the reason that we're not running is because we're weighed down. Right, man, maybe you need to be running instead of walking. God has called you to, to, to engage and you need to let go of some things. Work with wisdom. God gives you and lay aside everything else. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, David, you know the story, he's going to slay Goliath, and, and, and Saul wants to put his armor on him. And what's David do? He says, like, I can't deal with all this armor. I'm not used to it. So he picks up the sling, right, and the rock, and he goes out, and he, and he slays Goliath with the things that he's used to. He was lightweight. He was, he was ahead of his time. Now, he learned eventually to deal with the, with the armor, but the point is this. What are you trusting to bring victory other than the Lord and the things that he's already provided? See, David wasn't ready to put on that armor. He would eventually use the armor. He would eventually use a, he would eventually go out with a sword. I mean, David didn't stay there using a slingshot the rest of his life. But what he had done is he had proven what he did have. 
He took what God gave him and he exercised it. He learned how to use the sling. He learned how to perfect it. He learned how to defend the flock with it. And when push came to shove and God needed somebody that could stand up in a battle, he took a boy that was proven and used him to slay a giant. Beloved, that's who God wants us to be. Take what God gives you and use it. He'll grow you in. You're, some of you worry way too much. Oh, I gotta be a pastor, I gotta be a missionary, or I gotta be involved in ministry at some level I don't wanna be involved in. Quit crying, quit complaining, and focus on Jesus Christ and be who God has saved you to be. He'll get you to through all that other stuff. If that's what he's called you to, he'll get you through it. That is a light affliction. That is nothing to stop. Focus on the reality of the battle at hand and it will move you forward. It will compel you past all this other carnality and get you engaged in something that is tangible, that is real, that is worth dying for. You guys checking out what I'm talking You guys get what I'm saying? I just, man, I tell you what, it seems like the church is just off course. It's like the reality of why we're here is missing. And uh, man, I'm not, I'm, saying, I'm not saying our church, but I'm just saying in the church, it's anemic. And we just need to, we need to really understand that we are to not just come to church and listen to the word of God, but we are to take this book and we are to understand it. That's why we have discipleship, so you can get your hands on it, so that you can take it out and use it, so you can engage it in someone else's life. Before long, God's gonna call you to stand before Goliath and you won't be scared. You know, David wasn't scared. You know why he wasn't scared? He was, he was angry. I can't even say what I wanted to say. He was angry that someone would trespass on his property and destroy God's people. It makes me mad that the devil wants to destroy my kids. And he wants to destroy these kids down the E-wing. It irritates me. And I gotta remember, I don't bite flesh and blood, it's spiritual. I gotta love the drug dealer. I gotta love the pervert. All right, I gotta do all that. Because why? God wants to save their soul. But isn't there a part of you that says, hey, let's get them before they get there. I don't know, that's the way I like to roll. Don't trust anything but the Lord for victory. Take the word of God. Take what he's given you and use it. You don't need a new job to be a great minister for Jesus. Start where you are. I remember when I was in Mexico City one day visiting Blake Anderson many, many years ago. He says, Brian, we learn to live on less each year. And he didn't say that like, oh, I feel sorry for me. He was actually excited about the fact that they had learned to lighten their load. As, they're, as they're, they open the fridge and, they're, and the, 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 what do you call it, the shelf in the, in the refrigerator is propped up with mayonnaise jars. Living like Mexicans. I'm like, wow, that humbled me. Beloved, are we willing to live on less so we can accomplish more? Man, I, I never forgot that lesson. Are we willing to live on less to accomplish more? What's robbing our time? What's robbing our talent? What's robbing the treasure from us? Are we willing to let go of something? Are we willing to die to ourselves so that we can accomplish more? You know, Paul needs his son and the Lord to be ready to identify with the testimony of the Lord, to partake of the afflictions of the gospel. To do that, he has to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He has to be a faithful steward. He has to make disciples. This morning, are you ready? It may be that, oh, man, I'm ready. I'm ready, Brian. I know all the stuff. I know more than you do, preacher. I would say you probably do, okay? Listen, this is the next question you need to answer. Are you willing? God will try your heart with the gospel. Are you willing? What concrete decisions do you need to make today? Are you entangled? Say, I want to make a decision, but I'm all tangled up. Well, who's going to release you? It's going to be the Lord Jesus. You may need to make decisions even today so that you can be who God has saved you to be so you can accomplish that which God has saved you to accomplish. The question really is, are you willing? We know he's willing. He'll go all the way for us. He already has proved that. He's gone all the way for us. So then he just turns it over and says, how, willing you, how far are you willing to go in your relationship with me? A son, oh, that's great. A steward, that's awesome. Anybody taking a soldier? Anybody want to be a soldier? Amen. I'm not trying to put you on an emotional trip here. I'm just asking. That's something to ask in your heart. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity.